Welcome to Mindset Mastery with your host, George Reister. Listen, this year is going to be an amazing year. We have a, a guest on today that is going to ignite a fire up on the, in every individual that hears this podcast. I want to make sure that you go out and please leave a five-star rating for us. Uh, also share our social media sites, LinkedIn, YouTube, share our podcast. We're, we're always engaging with the audience as much as we can every week and every day. This year is a, gear, a year of giving for us. That is my foundational principle that I want to really lay, lay my footprint on and, and just stay consistent with it to give as much as I can to you and to each individual that, that's engaging in our conversations on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I've also decided to partner with a foundation this year, St. Jude Research Hospital, which is in Memphis, Tennessee, my hometown. St. Jude covers all the medical expenses and medical costs for children with cancer. And I'm gonna ask you to please, you find it in your heart to donate to St. Jude uh, as often as you can. There's no amount, amount that is insignificant to them and to the cause. They would appreciate it, I would appreciate it. And there again, we get a chance to give and share with one another. This year is gonna be amazing. We're gonna have a lineup of, hope, of guests that from all genres and all backgrounds. Cause I wanted to make sure that we cover the broad audience that we have, both uh, internationally and in the US. And so we're looking forward to getting this show started with an amazing guest and we'll see you in a moment. Here we go. My long awaited guest, Fatima Oliver. Couldn't wait to get this lady on the show. Once I started reading her uh, information about her, learning a little bit more about her background. So without further ado, I'm gonna start off letting Fatima tell us something about herself and her journey and what's taking place in her life right now. Oh boy, that's a loaded question. So <laughs> I'm Fatima. Uh, I'll put this out here now. Fatima C. Oliver. That'll help you out in the future if you if you try to look me up. But um, I am Fatima, born and raised in Vegas, the West Coast. Um, I'm currently living in Ohio with my three boys. I actually have four boys, um, but three are, are still, I still have to feed three. And um, yeah, and then my, and my husband. So I'm the only um, source of estrogen in this house, but, but, but don't <laughs> fret, don't fret. Cause I'm still a queen for sure. <laughs> okay. um, and, and yeah, so I, I grew up actually um, the only girl out of five boys actually. And, um, and um, growing up with a single, um, uh, in a single family home, like many people. Um, and I'm a single mother who did the best that she could to provide for all. It was actually four in her home, um, four of her children and just that frustration that can come with um, not being able to make ends meet, having to rely on the government for certain assistance, knowing that life is not fair for those that look like me and just that undercurrent of frustration that that um, she lived with on a day-to-day -day basis as she took care of us, basically served as a way of disciplining too. So whenever we were just being how kids can be, um, it was definitely that feeling of, why don't you guys get how much I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing for you? And yeah. so in that, it became a, a bit more hostile than it probably needed to be um, in my home. Um, it, it, growing up the only girl, a lot of times um, people would think that I was the princess and, and I'm gr a little, gr I know how to be girly anyway, I know how to be um, girly now. And so they have this idea of it was all pink uh, everywhere and the princess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, in my home, it was definitely rough and tough, and um, there wasn't a lot of room for um, emotion. 
and there wasn't a lot of room for stopping to process emotions and feelings. It really was a survival type of mindset in my home. My mom, she had to survive and we were taught to survive. And so I really think that that impacted uh, my upbringing into my young adulthood and really all the way up into my 40s, trying to figure out how to deal emotionally with things um, in a healthy way. And um, and so, yeah, so I, I've been through um, quite a bit, just like anybody. I don't really feel that, um, although it's a lot, I don't really feel like my story is, is any special um, than anybody else. I've been through similar, if um, or there may be people that have gone through more than me, but um, I've definitely been through um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional, mental abuse. They would go hand in hand, honestly. Yeah. Um, I've, I've lost a, a brother who was like my best friend. I've also lost a child. Um, I have a child right now who um, challenges um, sickle cell anemia, um, mm. auto deficiency, or, or an inherited blood disease. Um, and um, yeah, so I've been through quite a bit um, in my life that has led me, that actually um, kind of justified me having anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. um, and um, even before I recognized that that's what it was that I was dealing with. Um, it was kind of with me, shoot, um, for years before I even was able to get some type of assistance with the depression primarily. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually through going through a lot of different events and making horrible decisions, I would say mostly dating decisions, <laughs> but horrible, <laughs> decisions, horrible decisions and just trying to cope with the different things that was coming towards me called life. Mm -hmm. um, I eventually um, had to make my way to speak to somebody and and now on the other side of a lot of it, I'm still a work in progress, but on the other side of a lot of it, I've been blessed to be able to feel the freedom to speak about my story and to write a book about my story and to feel like um, I can stand in the gap for those people who may not have gotten their voice yet. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that book today. <laughs> I've been waiting to bring this subject up, but I have a question for you. When you said that um, you saw help, and now I know in the African American community, sometimes that can be very difficult. I know it was for me. I, if you would have mentioned therapy to me when I was in my twenties or teens, I don't know. You crazy? That's for somebody else, yes. not yeah. me. How did you navigate to that through that? I'm like, I'm glad you're keeping it real because sometimes yeah. I have to kind of go around that, that that's yeah. a cultural, sometimes a cultural thing, but it's true. And so for much of my life, like I stated, really, um, since I can remember, if I go back in my, in my, you know, back in my, my years, and it's harder now that I'm a little older, but going back, back, um, even uh, to my earliest memory, I just remember feeling sadness. I don't ever really recall just feeling exuberant on the inside out. You know how you want your kids to feel. You don't want them to have that weight, the heaviness of the world, and just want them to be, we say, quote, unquote, be a kid for a little longer. That right. innocent. I lost my innocence of, uh, when I was a child, and I went through a lot of things as a child to where I was just used to pain and sorrow that just followed me. So for a long time, I didn't even know that I had an issue. And so only till around in my mid twenties, after I had a child and really had gone through plenty of moments where I wanted to take my own life, or at least I entertained taking my own life. And even the times when I, I believe for me that I use that as a way to scream for attention for somebody to help me. But after so long, it became um, screaming for attention and it transitioned into, I really want to do this. And so I went through that up until my mid thirties before I got to a place where I felt like I had no choice but to get help. But prior to that, I would occasionally have conversations with, you know, those people that are closer to you more than likely was family. Yes. And I would say, I feel like something's wrong with me. Like, I just feel like I'm losing my mind. Like, mm -hmm. I just feel like I'm going crazy. Mm -hmm. And I love them so much. But what they would say, it would, you could say an, an enablement or um, they didn't know how to cope either. So they yes. would say, girl, ain't nothing wrong with you. Ain't nothing <laughs> wrong with you. You need to toughen up. You wear your, you wear your feelings on. 
pain. You wear your feelings on your sleeve. You're too sensitive. That's what's wrong with you. It's your emotions. You're too sensitive. You need to toughen up. And so all of these things were being said to me where in my, in, in, you know, in my neighborhood, you know, our culture, um, as a, as a black woman, I was taught growing up to be tough because there was no guarantee a man was going to be in my home. So I, I, I grew up to be tough and to survive and to deal and emotions was never a factor. So now I'm in my twenties and I'm saying something wrong with me. And those people who have taught me to not pay attention to my feelings and those cousins who grew up with me learning to not pay attention to their feelings are saying, there's nothing wrong with you. Move those feelings out, through, out of the way. And right. so um, I really, it was really after I had um, three children, I'll say I had three children. And for me, a trigger was finding out that my newborn was, um, I had sickle cell and it was just some other host of things that was happening. I always felt sad. I always felt like something was wrong with me, not quite mm -hmm. figuring it out. Um, my son had found out he had sickle cell. I lost my job on maternity leave and oh, it's just wow. these host of things happening that kind of just made me go into this spiral. And um, that was really um, when I felt I didn't have a choice um, but to, mm. to go to the doctor. And it, it was a conversation that I had with God. And it was, Lord, this is the umpteenth time I'm afraid I'm fasting over this. I prayed. I read every scripture I know to read. I would worked in the church. I've been in worship. I've done usher board. I've done intercessory prayer. I've done absolutely everything that I think you would want me to do. But I'm not feeling fulfilled. I'm not feeling better. And it just slapped me like a brick to my head. And it was Fatima go to the dang doctor. And I was like, who's in there? <laughs> Who that is? <laughs> <laughs> and how did you find the doctor? How did you find the therapist that you ended up seeing? Well, it took me honestly before I ever reached the the moment of getting therapy. That was like a ten year crawl, I would wow. say over ten year crawl. Mm -hmm. um, I started out with getting medicated, and so I just went to my regular physician, mm -hmm. my doctor, and um, just walked in there, and I, I just had enough. Faith, enough belief that God had spoke to me, enough hope um, to get me um, to, to schedule an appointment and to go in and humble myself. I definitely uh, am a proponent in believing that help begins with humility. Mm -hmm. And so I had to humble myself for that little bit of time mm -hmm. and humble my pride of what people might think. Yes. And walk in there. And when that doctor came in, I just was crying all over the place. I couldn't even oh, get myself wow. together. I couldn't even be poised. I was just a mess. Yeah. But um, but once I expressed how 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 painful all these voices in my head and the loudness and and mm -hmm. my my thoughts are so loud, I can't shut them off. And and I don't know how to deal. Um, she told me that I was um, suffering from um clinical depression. And really, mm -hmm. that was the first time I had ever even known that was a thing. Of course, I had mm -hmm. seen plenty of commercials, yes. but I just really disassociated myself from the person on the TV, even though I could relate. Mm -hmm. And so when she expressed that I had clinical depression and then was able to give me something to help me, mm -hmm. I cried then because I, for the first time, I, I felt like I was I was getting help. Like somebody yes. wasn't telling me, girl, ain't nothing wrong with you. I was getting yes. help. And, and, and yeah, and once I started on the medicine um, for that season in my life, it definitely helped me to be a more clearer thinker. Mm -hmm. I was emotionally charged. I always felt like I was living like when you turn on this, when you turn on the stove, you put it on simmer, you really put it on simmer so that when you need to make it go hotter, it'll do it really quick. Well, that's how my emotions were. I was mm -hmm. on simmer. So anytime uh, anything would awesome. happen was sad or angry i would just mm -hmm. flip out and it helped to balance all of that oh my goodness so the people that were responding that girl ain't nothing wrong with you because we i've been through that before myself and and, and really what they're saying is i don't know what to tell you <laughs> so, so this is the easiest way i can handle this i just dismiss it myself because usually they have their own pain that they're going through that they don't know how to deal with either yeah. and so when you started moving forward forward to get seek help it reminds me of i'm thinking that in the through that process that your fear was stopping you from moving forward yeah fear of you know maybe you it wouldn't work maybe you would be 
ex experience all these emotionals and feelings about uh, letting someone know what was going on. But then something more powerful kicked in, faith. Absolutely. You move that fear over to the side. And you say, hey, faith and fear can't live in the same place. I'm, I got to exercise some faith here. I got to put some faith in somebody to help me do this thing. Yeah, I, I, and I believe that, um, yeah, it was it was the the pain or the desire, I should say. It was the desire to get help was stronger mm -hmm. than I could be fearing, any, mm -hmm. any backlash or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, and I, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell, I didn't tell I, at the time it was my fiance. I didn't tell him right away. I, right. I didn't tell my mom. I didn't tell anybody for about a good, at least a good week because I didn't know how the medicine was going to deal with me. Right. Uh, but when I finally did tell him, he was like, look, whatever it is you doing, just keep doing it. Because <laughs> I see a difference. We see a difference. Yes. But, but, but to hit what you're saying, George, I definitely believe that. I was thinking in my um, journaling this morning, and I was thinking about the lame man. And um, I was just thinking about how he sat at the pool, mm. near the pool, this pool where you, basically if you could get to the pool, that it said that an angel would come down and like anoint the pool to where whoever, the first person to get to that pool would be healed. And the mm. lame man was sitting feet away from the pool for 38 years. Yes. 38 years he sat away a little way close enough to see it you know how mm -hmm. you say i'm so close yet so far away yes. that's how he was right. and it got you gotta think just like when we're dealing with situations you gotta just just in our own situations that we can think about something that has taken forever to come to pass yes. after so long you honestly start saying it's just gonna stay like this Right. It's just where it's going to be. Yes. And so he was like that somewhere for 38 years. You got to think that somewhere down the line, he said, this is just how it's going to be. Yes. And so he even stopped trying to reach to the pool. Instead, he started asking for resources. Help mm -hmm. me in my ailment. Help right. me to medicate my mm -hmm. ailment. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. Jesus that came to him. I'm a Christian. This is just my faith. Yes. But it was Jesus that came to him and said, pick up your bed and walk. And he's like, huh? No, I need you to give me, give me, give me something mm -hmm. to basically continue to medicate myself, to basically yes. continue to stay in my state, mm -hmm. but, but help a sister out a little bit, right? Right. And he's like, no, you know, you say you want to be healed. Mm -hmm. Well, put your faith in front of it, right? Exactly. And it wasn't until, and this is what I thought about, and, and it's, it, it was whether it was my depression, or any other situations that I have been in. It was not until I put effort forward, not knowing if I could do it or not, out, not knowing if it's gonna happen or not, but by faith, putting that effort out that I was able to see, wow, I can do this. It was not until the layman actually picked up his bed and put strength up under his feet that mm -hmm. he realized he could walk. He didn't know he could walk. He's right. like, Jesus is a miracle worker, but yes. I don't know that he did that miracle for me. And then right. you can think about all the fears of what if I fall back down and people start laughing at me? Mm -hmm. Or what if they see that I can't do it or that disappointment if I try and I fail? But he put all that aside and decided to use that faith in that instant. And I believe that, that that's how um, people who get healed or people who... Um, who persevere, who have redemptive redemption, somewhere in their life, they get to that place where the fear is, begins to subside and their desire to be healed, yes. desire to whatever that passion is, is so much more stronger that yes. they may be scared, still, but they decide to do it scared. And and I think that was one of the incidences that that that's you know what I experienced in that moment with the depression and going to go get help. Mm -hmm. I was. Scared. I didn't know what they were going to say to me, um, but but I just needed that help so bad. Oh, wow. That is uh, an awesome, awesome testimony and journey and, and sharing with us an experience that will hopefully move someone else to to share and and, and seek help and to uh, it, and if, if, if at all possible, find the ability to want to get closer to Christ and and, and to relieve themselves of some of the same issues that you were going through from, um, oh, wow. See, this is why I wanted you on the show. <laughs> this is why I wanted you on the show. Now. 
Yeah. Now I want to know about this book. When I saw it, I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, who writes a book and says the prescription is in the dirt? Okay, I got to know what's going on. <laughs> How did you well, come up with that title? Well, okay, so so I was, we're going to fast forward to about 12 years. I've been on medicine and it was helping medicate. And I was grateful for that. But after mm. so long, God wanted me to do some for real work. Mm. And I still take my medicine. I don't want anybody to hear me say, stop taking your medicine. But after so long, it became, why, what is causing this, these feelings? What is yes. it? What is it mm -hmm. that I keep trying to calm my, my emotions from? Like, what is all that stuff? And so I really got to a place where I felt like I was losing my natural mind. I really did. I had, mm. Um, um, from visually, I had the job, I had the, a, a great job. I had the income that I always said, if I just made this amount of money, I can take care of my kids and I'll, I won't feel the way that I feel and my emotions, my emotional state would be better and I could get off the medicine. And I had the, the decent enough car. It wasn't, it wasn't my dream car, but it was good enough, you know, to trick somebody and make them say, Hey, you riding good. And I'd be like, yeah. thank you. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. good enough. It was good exactly. enough. And so I had all those things in the, in the, physical, but I still felt so just lost. And I really, truly got to a place where I felt I was scared that I was losing my mind. I thought I was having um, a nervous breakdown. And that was mm -hmm. just a few years, like two years ago, Max, uh, mm -hmm. I thought I was having a nervous breakdown. And so I, again, I was sitting in my car uh, crying and sobbing and I, I was on my mat still having anxiety attacks like five out of seven days. And so I felt that unctioning. And that by, th by then I had a tribe of people who were like-minded, who were, I look at them as my sister friends or my sisters in Christ who have carried me through plenty of things in my life. And I've done the same for them. And they, um, after talking to them and getting godly counsel, they said, Fatima, I think it's time for you to go and get some talk therapy. I'm glad you're on your medicine, but it may be time for you to go talk to somebody. And I really, because of my, my relationship with them, that I was able to hear them when they were giving me the truth right? They were giving me some truth serum. And mm -hmm. when I got up the nerve and I went and sat on the couch and we started dealing and delving into my emotional state. And at first I was like, just give me something to give me some breathing exercises. We're not talking about no family stuff. We're not hitting no pillow with no pillow <laughs> thing. We're not doing none of that. I'm not doing all that with you. I just want you to tell me how to breathe so I can mm -hmm. get through my day. And yeah. so I went in resistant. And after about a month, um, I just felt like God was telling me, Fatima, you have to participate in your healing. Mm. Want to feel Ooh. better, want to heal. Well, you have to be a participant. You can't tell this person how to help you, but mm -hmm. then you want to get healed. Right. And so, um, so I, I had my medicine. I went to therapy and, and I, and God was stayed the center, whether I understood what was going on, whether I felt like he was, wasn't anywhere to be found. I always prayed, always sat after his, just him, his face. And, um, and I joined a Bible study group at, at, at church, which wound up being this group program called Celebrate Recovery. And mm -hmm. so Celebrate Recovery is similar to a Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous um, type of program, but it deals with all type of hurts and hangups that you may still have. Mm -hmm. So right. anything that makes you get riled up when you start talking about it, well, that's mm -hmm. a hangup or mm -hmm. that's a yes. hurt. And yes. it, 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 it confronts, it makes you, it forces you, it motivates you aggressively to confront those hurts and hangups. So I had three things working for me. I had medicine. I had therapy. I had my church and the Bible study or the program working for me. And mm -hmm. the program was like a nine month program. All of that together is what I needed to get my healing. Now in the process of that at the end, they were like, well, you gotta, we want you to see how far you've come and now we want you to tell your testimony. When I started writing about my life, and I started writing about all the things that I had dealt with and all the things that God showed me was suppressed. And I looked at it. I said, well, hey, that's a book. <laughs> that's mm. a dang book. Yes. And, um, and by then I had realized that God was really pushing me and nudging me. And I was hard headed for so many years, but he was mm -hmm. nudging me to deal with all that dirt, all those taboo things mm. that talk about that the silent generation says don't talk about that we don't talk yes. about we don't we don't we don't we don't indict the uncle 
but you can't go over to his house. That right. type of stuff, right? So right. dealing with all that type of stuff and and all the hurts and and residue from the things that I had survived. Mm -hmm. That's what the dirt is. And oh. the prescription is dealing with it from going down deep into that soil, deep into that dirt and turning it and rising it up so that the plants can grow. And mm -hmm. if we're not careful, that same dirt that I just talked about, the abuse, the anger, the rage, the the depression, anxiety, the feeling un, unworthy, insecurity, all of that stuff, if we're not careful, it will bury us just like dirt do, and we'll be dead on the inside. And so I heard the I heard it in a it was um, a, a guy that came to a church and I, I heard his message and he just threw that out as a nugget and said, whoever it's for, you take it. It's for somebody. And I said, thank you very much, sir. That was for me. That, that <laughs> matches my book. The, the yeah. And is in the dirt. And I truly believe that because I've done it myself. Wow. That was powerful. <laughs> That was powerful. Just a description of how you related those emotions, the feeling, that pain, and then how you brought it back into what was the healing properties and how that all worked together. Oh my wow. man, that's that's incredible. So you know, I'm encouraging my the audience to go out and grab that book the first chance they get. Now I noticed that you mentioned. I read something that you talked about and said. Uh, let me see. You had three foundational things, principles. And one is that everyone needs a safe place to fall. Let's yeah. talk about that. So a safe place to fall, as my example that I gave, George, would be those women that I went to and that I was in my rawest form and most vulnerable state. And they held me and they bared the infirmity of the weak, as the Bible say. They carried me and they gave me the truth in love. And they said, Fatima, you need to go talk to somebody. Uh, but they didn't just say, girl, you need to go talk to somebody. It wasn't like that. <laughs> okay. right. It wasn't like, girl, you crazy. You need to go talk to somebody. <laughs> but it was Fatima, you need to go talk to somebody and we're here for you. I want, tell us when you make your first appointment. We want to celebrate with you. Mm. Tell us when you, after you're done with your appointment, call me so that we can celebrate with you. And they helped me get through the door, my first appointment. They were there for me and they continue to hold me up. A safe place to fall is not always your spouse. It's not always your mom or your dad or your closest girlfriend. My safe, uh, I have multiple safe places to fall. Another mm -hmm. extension of that is my therapist. I love my therapist, but, yes. but that's my safe place to fall. But the point is that a safe place to fall is some place where you can be your ugliest. It's some mm -hmm. place where you can be your rawest. And you, you can say those things that are, especially when you are dealing with depression and anxiety, sometimes you just need to say, I feel like I want to kill myself. They don't mean you want you're gonna go do it. Right. But keeping exactly. it captive in your keeping it in your head imprisons mm -hmm. you. Yes. You have to take that thought captive, but you gotta recognize what the thought is. Mm -hmm. But you need some place safe where you can say that and they don't be like, We need to call the police on you. But right. they meet you where you're at and yes. they can help carry you to a resolution. And so that's mm -hmm. what the place to fall is. Oh, that's so awesome. You know what's what's interesting about that and in that story is that uh, I'm an actor, right? Well, you you didn't know it, but yeah. And so one of the things that we deal with when we go to acting class, I studied the Meisner technique and some other things, but they deal with trying to get right to that real emotion, that real, let's get deep. Let's, let's talk about what's really happening inside you. All the things that you don't want to share. First thing, just break that down. Just, just tear you down so that you feel free about expressing those feelings and that, those emotions and letting it come out into your character. Yeah. And, and that's what you were experiencing with, you know, uh, you know, finding that safe place that, <sighs> wow. Yeah, but I also think that we all have to go there. We gonna go there, okay? Yeah. It's just how. That's so right. the emotion is gonna come out. Yeah. It's just, is it gonna come out in a healthy way, in a mm -hmm. constructive way? Or is it yes. going to come out in a fit of anger over some French fries that the chick didn't give you at the McDonald's right. and now you walking in there going crazy? The yes. feelings are there and yes. they are alive and they deserve to be honored. Jesus mm -hmm. cried, right? Yes. 
Yes. So what went, what makes us, he had every emotion. He got angry when the people were gambling in the temple. He threw them out and turned over tables. Uh, That's he, right. He, right. He felt every emotion. So yes. what makes us think that we are not allowed to feel yes. those emotions? And so exactly. that was one of the things that my therapist helped me to see that Fatima, you are tough. And mm. that's, you've been able to survive so many things, but you haven't dealt with those emotions that came with those things. Mm. And you have to be able or stop feeling like you're weak for expressing those yes. emotions. And I have been told that, that I was weak when I wanted to cry or when I felt sadness. And I really think that that's just another way to keep our culture, keep mm -hmm. our people, um, yes. you know, what is it, imprisoned. In yes. Prison. And that's it. I was going to go back to that because that was one of the first things that we talked about with your relatives and you wanted to, oh, girl, ain't nothing wrong with you. You just need to be tough. We all experienced that at some time, one time or another with our families and the closest people who we hope we can give that express those things too. And we find out, you know, it's not, not that time for them. They don't know how to deal with it themselves. Now, number two, yes, a victim mentality must change to a victim mentality. Yeah, so I'm I'm a strong believer that for me, in order for me to have walked through my healing journey, I call it a soul healing process, but mm -hmm. my healing journey where I was, I didn't really know, I was like stumbling and I didn't really understand what was going on with me. Somewhere down the line, I had to make a decision to change mm -hmm. my thinking, to shift mm -hmm. my thinking. And no matter what people, spoken over me that I had to make a decision that I was not those things, but I was who God said I was. And I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but I mm. knew that it was a negative, right? Mm. I knew enough to right. know it was. And so my mind had to shift from, this is the way my life is going to always be. This is how I was raised. So this is just how it is. Yes. And I'm always going to be living on, on, on um, assistance. Mm -hmm. I'm never going a good job no matter how much i want i'll never be able to go to school i'll never be able to do anything other than what i'm doing because i'm not worth more than what i think i am right now mm. that is a lie from the pit of hell and yes. i had to learn that in order for me to move forward in an open-minded way to get whatever god was trying to show me i mm. had to open I had to change that thinking. Yes. Thinking, um, I call it self-victimization when we stay in that space of this is all yes. I'm is all I can get. And mm. then sometimes we sabotage our own success. That's we won't true. show up to the class on time because we feel like we're going to fail anyway. Yes. Or we'll date the same type of guy that we know ain't no good, right. but that's all we're, that's all we qualify for in our head and in our yes. heart. And so I had to allow God to shift that thinking. And a part of that self victimization, breaking that trap was acknowledging that, yes, I was a victim on a lot of things that happened in my life. It was mm -hmm. not my fault. I recognize that. Mm -hmm. However, at some point in my life, I'm held accountable for which I understand. Mm -hmm. And if I understand something ain't right, I need to change that. Yes. I need to fix it. That's my responsibility. That's not the mm -hmm. responsibility of the person that hurt me. It's my responsibility because it's my life. And another thing was I had to take those negative thoughts captive. The Bible says, take those negative thoughts captive. So I had to really make some stuff in the in the word. I'm not a, a, a genius in the word, but what I did understand, I had to make it come alive in my life and in my, in my life practices. So when I would have negative thoughts that would naturally flow in my head, because that's what I was used to, I was used to thinking negative. I was used to thinking I'm not worthy. I was used mm -hmm. to all of that. I had to say, okay, I got a game plan. When these thoughts start coming into my head, I'm going to block them. And I'm going to say, nope, I'm not thinking that. And I'll yes. replace it with something positive. Yes. And I would do it over and over again until it became a habit. Mm -hmm. And yes. be beyond the 21 days, it actually takes 63 days for the subconscious to believe yes. what you're trying to sell it. So I Correct. kept going and kept going. And that was that's the whole process of changing your victim mindset to mm -hmm. a victor mindset that you can, you can survive anything, but you you got to deal with this up here. That's the yes. first surviving to deal with this up here. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And, you know, one of the things that I did in my own personal life, three tools I use every day without fail, 
most of the time I do it in the morning before I get my day started. But sometimes, you know, the day gets started before we get started and I may do it a little bit later, but I like to do it because it sets the stage for my day. So I'm really rigid about getting it done early. And one is my gratitude list. All the things I'm grateful for, you know, my kids, my wife, my family, my job, waking up, you know, breathing, the sim- started with the simplest things. Now that list has grown to, um, you know, I write a hundred gratitudes a day just because it, it, it makes me reflect back on who I am and what I am and what the, and what I should be putting inside me that's going to help me keep me healthy. Absolutely. Two, my affirmations. I'm always writing my affirmations. And I'm always, matter of fact, here, here's, here's something right here. I keep my affir- affirmations Absolutely. close by because yeah. I, when, when, I, when my thinking gets you know, skewed a little bit, I got to go bring myself back. I have to have a way to bring myself back. And third is meditation. I always spend time just to block out all the outside noise, some quiet time, so I can reflect back on God's word and just the positivity of what I want to receive and what I want to happen in my life. And the other thing that changed me from a spiritual perspective was I started documenting and writing all of the the, scriptures that related to the things that I wanted, things yeah. that related to me and that I that I want to happen in my life. And so every day I started going over those scriptures every day and I started, next thing you know, boy, I felt differently. I saw things differently. And and some of the things that I would, choices that I would normally make, I wouldn't make those choices anymore because those choices were no longer for me to make. Right. So I started Absolutely. making different decisions. So I get where you're coming from. I get where you're going. And, and I, we're gonna to go to number three. Now this so- one, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> jump down my seat when I when I when I saw this. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to remain that way. I said, let me get look. look. You know how on on uh, uh um, I don't know if you watched The Voice or not with uh yeah yeah, okay. yeah. so Kelly Clarkson liked to throw her shoes right. I went and got this Bible girl. I was like, let me throw this Bible. Oh, what, 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 what what is this girl? Come on, talk to me. Yeah, but it's true. And we all, I, I really believe that somewhere deep inside of us, we know that. We know when we acting crazy. We know when we are off our rocker or we really tripping. Like we know because it's us that we have to live with, right? Have you ever been been in a place where you make your own self sick? Like I've totally <laughs> been there before. <laughs> well, I'm like, I don't even want to talk to myself. <laughs> like, oh my God. But but I, I believe that it's a disservice. It's it's okay to to recognize <laughs> I'm something wrong. Like it's okay to be ooh, I'm tripping, you know. But it's not okay to nestle in like it's a good old piece of furniture that you're comfortable with. It's yeah. not okay to nestle in and stay that way. I yes. truly believe that it's a disservice to God. Mm-hmm. I believe service to yourself. It's a disservice to your family. Now keep in mind when you start adjusting and shifting your thinking and making better decisions for yourself, you're not the only one that's going to be challenged to change. The, your surroundings are going to be challenged to change too. Yes. And when I started to change my thinking and and basically became more aware of who I was, but became aware of my habits, my mm-hmm. bad habits too. And, um, and so I, I would make, a, like you're saying, I would make a point to stop doing certain things because I recognize what I was doing or what I said and how it impacted somebody. So I was more aware of myself and what I was contributing to my family. And so when I started changing my speech, my family wasn't quick to change their speech. They were still, right. they were still defensive. They were still ready, you know, yes. and it took them some months. It really did for them to see that I wasn't going to be throwing jabs at them. Mm-hmm, so my right. husband was like, my husband was ready. He was like, oh, here she come. But I was, and I kept saying, um, baby, I'm telling you that I'm changing. And it really took some months for him to say, okay, she truly is trying to transform herself. And mm-hmm. then it challenges, it challenges your external. And so you have to understand that no matter how, or, or, or we, I guess I should say, have to understand and embrace that no matter how much we decide that 
we want to change. Our external is going to be impacted, but our change has to be more important. I say, I, I feel like my biggest test was loyalty to my family mm. or my peace. And mm -hmm. for me, writing the book and sharing things that were taboo things, things that I was expected to maybe take to my grave with me, it was never said, but it was kind of an expectation. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm speaking on these things. I felt like I was in a place where my biggest challenge was understanding that if I put this out here, the change that's gonna happen may not be good. Like as far as the relationship, now yes. I'll, I'll feel better, but do I want to risk losing that relationship? And yes. that was so hard. And I prayed and I was like, God, I don't want to, I want them both. I yes. want them both. That's yes. what I said. God, I yes. want it. I want it all. And I cried because I knew that I couldn't have it all. And right. that was my tears were because I had to accept mm -hmm. that Fatima, which one do you want more? Do you want your peace? Oh. Or do you want to be viewed as loyal? Yes. And so I had, and that decision was a painful one. On the other side of it, mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that I chose my peace. I'm so grateful that I chose to follow what God told me to do. Mm -hmm. And I feel so much more free. I tell people, I feel like I'm on, I'm on the top of a, a building and you see on the movies and they go to the top of the building and they scream. And I feel, <laughs> like, I feel like I'm on the top of the building now. And I'm just like, my life matters. I matter, you know? Yes. And, but I never felt that before. And so um, unfortunately I had to lose to gain. And I guess usually that's how it works anyway. It, it really does. And, you know, I experienced that same thing when I wrote my book, what's the hold up? Nothing's, nothing's getting me getting in my way. Um, and there were some stories, some information that I put in the book that were about my mother and my father and, and, and just about my family and our lifestyle and all that. So about a week ago, I had sent a copy to my mother's sister who lives in Kansas City. And I, I was always I was just so concerned that her, she has two sisters still alive. My mother's passed away. Yeah. And uh, so she, um, I sent it to both of them and I'm thinking, okay, okay, let's see how they're going to respond to this. Cause some things they probably, they knew what was going on in my household, but other things they may not have known. And so uh, she called me and she said, George, thank you so much for expressing everything you put in that book. Thank you for sending it to me. She said she cried for hours just reading the book. And I was wondering how, you know, she was going to take yeah. it and how they were going to react to it. I'm like, boy, that was, it was such a relief that I was able to yeah. hang on to yes. that relationship with her and yeah. maybe even enlighten her about some things that she didn't know because she may have had some preconceptions about what we were experiencing and what was going on in our life. But now she kind of has a outline of what I was experiencing as a child. Yeah, that happened actually with me. An aunt reached out. Not too many people have, <laughs> but but yeah. that's a part of it, right? I, and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, but my aunt did reach out, and surprisingly, I didn't even know she had read the book. And she reached out and she apologized to me, and she said, "I'm so sorry. I, you know, I should have been there for you." And yeah. I didn't even think that. She, I thought that she was the best aunt. Honestly, I, she was one of my my favorite aunts. Mm -hmm. But to her, when she read read the book and the detail, like you're saying, that I expressed in the book and my journey and, and just how things had damaged me, decisions had damaged me. Um, she apologized and said she felt that she should have been there for me. And so I'm just so grateful that my book has um, opened up the eyes of some of some relatives, but it also has um, brought people that I didn't even know um, reviewing the book and giving it such awesome ratings, which, and they are not my friends. I'm saying these are true people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but also, so, you know, some people who have reached out to me and wanted to talk and say, thank you for sharing that information about your son or about yourself in the book, mm -hmm. because I thought I was alone. And we theoretically know we're not alone. Yeah, but the yes. emotion of feeling lonely with a yes. story or with a secret, and they felt Correct. that they were no longer lonely with a secret. So uh, I, I'm I'm very I'm very grateful that God is using my story in that way. Well, I'm glad too because that that brought us together, and so yes. that's why we're here today. So we had a chance <laughs> to dialogue and conversate. And 
I want to ask you one last question. And I want to know, why was it important to you to tell your story? Telling my story was an extension of my therapy. Mm -hmm. It was an extension of my healing. And so, like I said, I, I, you know, I, I didn't go, I didn't go into detail on purpose because I want folks to read it, but, right. <laughs> but, right. Definitely. Um, but, but, um, but yeah, it definitely, um, I'm still on a, a journey of healing and there are some things that I still see come out that I'm like, wow, I didn't know that that bothered me. That happened years ago. So writing the book, helped me to process a lot of the yes. emotion of the actions. And I even, I'm sure you can attest, there were some things that I had to relive. Yes. And and there were some things that I thought I had gotten over and yes. it brought a lot of people. So this journey has truly, truly been about me giving myself a voice. I had never spoken up for myself. A yes. lot of my life, I spent it internalizing. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time. You can't tell because I talk so much. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this was the first time that I really had spoken up for Fatima. And um, and so, yeah, I really definitely view it as an extension of my healing, extension of my therapy and being able to talk to people like you and to share with listeners all across the globe, actually, which is crazy to me. But and I'm even given that opportunity, but that all the time when I'm able to sit and have these type of conversations, it continues to soothe my soul and heal me in areas that God knows that I need the healing in. So you, that's I why it was so important. You hit it right on the head. It was, it was definitely therapy for me too, writing my book. And I, I probably spent 95%, 95% of the time crying as I'm writing a book. There's, you know, as you, you know, you, yeah. you can attest to and you can experience, you know, you experience yourself. Now, um, I want to give you an opportunity also to uh, tell people where they can get your book and share any social media site, any information that they can contact you uh, to stay connected with you so that, you know, we continue to build our tribe and, and continue to grow our connection with one another because this will not be the last time Good. we have a show together. It will Good, I hope not. not. Be. Oh, Good. no, it won't be. And I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, I'm like, I'm an open book now. Ain't no need to me pulling back now. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can talk about anything. Tell me what you want to talk about, we'll talk about it, but. Um, okay. But for your for listeners, um, uh, it, again, it's Fatima C. Oliver. If you put that in, it should be easy to find me. But I'm on Facebook as Fatima Oliver. I'm on Instagram, Fatima Oliver 1975. They put my birth year in there. I don't like that. Um, <laughs> and, and LinkedIn also Fatima Oliver. But I also have um, Georgia website that I'm, I'm very happy about. And it is um, a www, but it's FatimaC.com. C is for my middle. Fatima.com. And if you pull it up, you'll be able to see um, um, just, just some blogging, a little bit of blogging. I'm not really huge on that, but I do basically have interviews such as this that I display on the website and then basically give some comments how I felt about the conversation and stuff like that. Um, so there, there's a, a bunch of videos there. But more importantly to me, um, I have a place on the site, if you go under appointments, where you can schedule a safe place session. And what that means is you get 20 minutes where you talk and I listen. If you haven't yet figured out what your safe place is or who that person is, you schedule some time with me and literally you just get whatever's on your heart out, um, be heard and um, have your voice and I would just listen. And this is a girlfriend corner. So what is said there stays there and do not ask my opinion if you do not want it because that's how <laughs> girlfriends do. Right. But, but really for the most part, it truly is a space for you to talk and for me to listen and just to be able to come alongside you in whatever it is that you're experiencing. So I do hope that, that um, someone takes me up on that opportunity. And of course, if you go on the website, it's gonna tell you about my book and how to get it. Um, but if you don't, you can also go to Amazon. It's a book and in paperback version, The Prescription is in the Dirt by Fatima C. Oliver. Awesome. Just <laughs> like I thought it would be, you made my day, Fatima. <laughs> You made cool. <laughs> my day, and I know every yeah. listener that's listening is thoroughly blessed, and we're continuing to, you know, we'll I'll, I'll be in agreement for everything that God has for you, and every journey that you 
embark on will come to full fruition and you will reap the rewards yes. of, of, of your gift. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you so much. <laughs> it was a, it was my pleasure.